honor and privilege to invite to the stage Mr. Matthew Bronfman, the head of the steering committee of Limud International and one of the donors and the supporter and whatever you can say. Good morning. So the interview will be in English and I don't know if there is a translation to Russian. Anyways, you know, good morning to you. How are you? Oh, yeah, you have to turn it. Oh, now it's on. Okay. How are you this morning? Very well, how are you? Yeah, great. Welcome to Limud. Thank you, thank you. I'm really impressed with what they're doing. The, you know, the idea of not telling people abroad, from the, you know, Jews from the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, not to tell them come to Israel or be whatever, just keep in touch. And that's a great idea, just keep in touch. And I think the, the main thing is, you know, it's there, the idea that you don't have to force anything. Who of, you know, you know it from your house. You decided to be more Jewish than your brothers, for instance. Correct. And yeah, and nobody forced you to do it, but you know, you felt that, you, you know, it's, it would be good to do it, right? Yes. But you know, here, when we are speaking uh, here in Limud, I really don't want to talk about your business. We can read about it in Wikipedia, in the internet. Everybody knows, you know, you own some shares in Discount and you had to, you used to have shares in Ribua uh, Kachol Alon and Shufa Salen, you know, and abroad blah, and everything. Blah, blah. Yeah, exactly. But I would like to know you personally. And I want to know where you grew up. You know, what motivates you, okay? And first of all, I would like to tell you to tell me what memories you have from your house growing up abroad in your family, your father being the head of the Jewish Congress, Mr. Ed Edgar Bronfman, uh, may he rest in peace. So tell me about your house. Well, we grew up, uh, we grew up in New York. Most people think that we're from Canada. You are from Canada, I mean, the family. <laughs> the fam, well, yes. Ontario, if I'm not... No, Montreal. Montreal. Uh, but my grandfather was actually born in, in Moldova. Oh. Uh, in, uh, in a small village called Atash, Ataki, uh, which is on the Ukrainian border. Yeah. And his father, my great-grandfather, took him and his siblings, his wife and siblings, and a rabbi, they left in 1889 oh. uh, and emigrated to Canada. And my father was born in Montreal and I was born in New York. So, but the business was started in Canada. So that's why everyone, it's a Canadian family. Quote the unquote. stillery, right? It was, in, it was in the beverage, al yes, beverage alcohol business. Yeah. Uh, but my father moved to New York uh, a few years after he, he and my mother got married. My mother was from New York. My mother was from a prominent uh, German Jewish banking family mm -hmm. and uh, what people don't understand or don't remember uh, you have the issue in, in Israel today of Ashkenazi and Sephardim yeah. and in America in those days there was a big issue between the Russian immigrants and the German Jews and so when they got married it was a big uh, scandal in a way <laughs> uh, anyway so we grew up in New York I was the fourth of five children oh so it's a big family. Yes, it's a okay. big family. Uh, we are four boys and, and one girl. Uh, and there are a lot of grandchildren at this <laughs> point. There are uh, 24, 25 grandchildren. Oh, that's nice. Yes, it's fabulous. Um, and, it, and it was, you know, it was, we grew up like everybody else. It didn't, it didn't, okay, maybe our house is a little bigger or whatever, but it didn't, it was seemed very, very normal. Uh, and, but we were not, we didn't have a Jewish education. What do you mean by that? You didn't go to Sunday school, you didn't go to shul, you didn't, you know, kiddush on, on Friday night? Love. None whatsoever. None whatsoever. Christmas tree. Christmas tree? Christmas In Hanukkah. Tree. Christmas tree. And Hanukkah also? Like no, the, the... no, no. Pesach. Oh. Pesach. Passover Seder was the only thing we did, but not even at home, at a, at a friend of my father's house. The High Holy Days? No. Rosh Hashanah, no. Yom Kippur? No, nothing. Nothing. Oh my God. I know, I know. It's, it's, and as a matter of fact, my father was once interviewed, but well, he was interviewed a number of times by Charlie Rose. But on uh, one interview, my father was asked by Charlie, uh, it, was a it was all about business. 
Uh, and he said, what's the biggest regret you have? And my father said, you know, Charlie, in business, you, uh, you make decisions based on the information at hand. And you make good decisions, and you make some poor decisions, and you move on. He said, but the biggest regret I have is I didn't provide a Jewish home for my children. That's a confession. It's I mean. an absolute confession on national television. It was pretty big, pretty big deal. Uh, two of his, of his children, myself and my younger brother, uh, have, have be, I would say, uh, become. Have, have become uh, very involved in Jewish life and, and provide Jewish homes for our children. And after your father became the head of the Jewish Congress, yes. did he become more Jew than before? Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely, he did. Uh, so he traveled the world with Rabbi Israel Singer, uh, who was the uh, executive secretary of the World Jewish Congress. And, and my father's Jewish journey, uh, spiritual journey, not political journey. The political journey already had started. His, his spiritual journey started when they were on an airplane traveling to somewhere, and, and Rabbi Singer was, was reading. Uh, and my father asked him what he was reading. And he basically said, you don't want to know. It's arcane discussions amongst rabbis about, you know, some very, very uh, detailed little argument. My father said, well, you know, we've got seven hours on the airplane. I don't really have much else to do, so why don't you explain it to me? And that's really how my father found the argument or the discussion fascinating. And that's when he started to learn. And I will tell you that at the very first limud in Moscow in 2006, uh, uh, Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz, and we should all say a prayer for his recovery. He had a stroke a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Um, he said to me, I want to tell you how much I admire your father. And I have to tell you, my eyes sort of rolled back because a lot of people come up to me you and tell me... He knew the history. He didn't blah, know it. Blah, blah, blah. You know, your father is a big philanthropist in business. And he said, no, no, no. None of that. He said, I admire your father because at the age of 50, he knew nothing. And he took it upon himself to learn, and it's only because he has spent the last 20 years learning that he has been able to become the Jewish leader that he became. And he said, most people at the age of 50, with the economics that your family have, they go to a beach, they go here, they go there, they don't get involved. He said, what your father did, and how he grew from 50 to 70 and 75 years old, he said, for that, I admire him. Uh, I mean, your father passed away three years ago. Correct. Did he ever came to uh, a, a one of the Limud's con conferences in New York or whatever? He did not, but he supported us. Mm. Uh, but he, he knew not. about your activity. Oh, in very Limud. much so, very much so, um, and absolutely supported it. Uh, and was very proud of what we were doing. But talking about your childhood, yes. well, were you like a baseball kid, a <laughs> basketball kid? Um, I did uh, uh, many sports. Yeah. Uh, I was never very good at basketball. Uh, I, was, I was particularly good at tennis, and I played tennis at university. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was, I was actually like a B-plus athlete at many things and an A-plus at nothing. Uh, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, and, and sort of, the, I would say the, the thing we love to do most as a family now is to ski, particularly my 11-year-old. Oh. Uh, so we go skiing a lot. But we know we did sort of normal things. We played baseball and swimming and tennis and, you know. And uh, you graduated from Harvard. I, uh, in 1985, I graduated from Harvard Business School. That's correct. And when did you uh, enter the business, the family business? I never entered the family business. Uh, my two older brothers were in the family business, and uh, I decided that, well, collectively we decided, I would guess, <laughs> I would say, that, that uh, you, you will go your own I would way. go my own way. Uh, and so I never. I never joined the family business. If I'm not mistaken, your father, your, your brother was the one to say, even though i born into rich, it doesn't mean that I'm stupid. He was quoted as saying that, that's yeah. correct. <laughs> <laughs> it means that it runs in the family, doing business and making business and making money. Well, it, uh, I guess it runs in the family. Not, not all of my siblings. Mm -hmm are involved in business, but uh, my, my brother Edgar Jr. Mm -hmm. and, and I are very much involved, yes. Okay. And uh, I would like to know what's Israel for you? Was it even, you know, mentioned in, in, your, in your home, in your family? Oh, sure, sure, sure. My grandfather, you know, there's my, my, the Bronfman family for many generations, three generations really, has been, been involved in Israel. 
Uh, and when I was 17 years old, I asked my father if I could go to Israel with him on his next trip. Hmm. And he said no. Why, not? Why is that? And that was not the answer I was expecting. And he said, I go to Israel all the time, and when I go, I see this minister, and I see that minister, and I don't see Israel anymore. He said, if you want to go and see Israel, buy yourself a ticket and go. Well, I was only 17, so that wasn't very interesting to me. Uh, so it took me a few years, and uh, in the spring break of my first year at Harvard, so I was, uh, I had graduated from college, worked on Wall Street for two years, so I was about 23 years old, 24 years old, it was, it was March of 1984. I bought myself an airplane ticket and I went to Israel by myself for 10 days. Tell me about your first visit. It what was, made the, I mean, the biggest impression on you? Um, well, the first person I met, actually he met me at the airport. He, uh, I was introduced to him by one of my Harvard professors, he was an Air Force pilot. And he literally, we met at the airport, uh, and he is a very dear friend today. He left the Air Force and has done very well uh, outside of the Air Force business. Um, and we spent a few days together. I spent time at the Hebrew University. I was in a, a submarine. I was in, 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 on his Air Force base, which he was the commander of at that time. And the, I guess what struck me was, and I was asked to come back when I came back to business school. Um, I gave a report to my section. And I said, if you think you have to be Jewish to go to Israel, you're, you're wrong. Israel is the most amazing place. It's the most energetic place, the most vibrant place. And when you walk around the old city of Jerusalem, to me anyway, you feel the spirituality, you feel the connection. And you see how people, and this was also 1984, so it was, um, a little different than the tension that, that exists today. Yeah. And I said, you see how people live together, and it is the most remarkable place I've ever been. Yeah, I know. You know, for me, Israel is a miracle. Yes, it's a miracle. it is a miracle. Nonetheless, I mean, it's really a miracle. Because when you think of it, we came back after 2,000 years. We, Hebrew, we speak Hebrew. You know, I, I, I'll tell you something. About a few years ago, the uh, chief of staff of the, F the French army came here on a secret mission and a secret visit. And he's very pious. He's, 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 uh, he's Christian and he's very pious. And he wanted us to take him to all the sites of the, of the Christian people. And he was so moved and he went on the Via Dolorosa and he did all the prayers and he, you know, he took some cross on his back and he went up the, the stairs and everything. And we went up to Nazareth and the, um, the, where he did the, um, the fish and the wine, you know, you, you, you probably know better than me, than I do. You know, not, not really. I mean, you know how to say it in English. My English is not, you know, it's not that brilliant. Anyway, so, uh, he was so moved and he starts crying. And I, tell it, I told him, listen, just imagine that Jesus said all these uh, prophecies, you say? Prophecies. Yeah. In Hebrew. Yes, he did. 2,000 whatever years ago, he said it in, in, in Hebrew. And he's quite the, f the most famous Jew in the world, right? He was like stunned <laughs> from what I said. But I said, well, but it's a fact. you know. And for us, being here in Israel, speaking Hebrew, walking in Jerusalem, and Bethlehem, and Hebron, or whatever, and you know, and, and Yafo, and Haifa, it's a miracle, really. A total miracle, yeah. right? So I don't know if you feel the same. Do you um, define yourself as a Zionist, and what does it mean for you being a Zionist? I absolutely define myself as a Zionist, and it means I'm, I'm, I'm in love with Israel, I'm a, and, and I support Israel. Uh, I do business here, um, as, I, as I told... Uh, you lose money here? I lose money here, and I make money here. <laughs> no, now. <laughs> you lost before. Yes, we've lost, we've made, on balance we've done very well, and it's... Uh, no complaints. No complaints. <laughs> uh, and first I fell in love with Israel, and now I fell, have fallen in love with an Israeli, so... I know. <laughs> Beautiful Natalie, right? Melanie. Melanie. Why <laughs> Natalie? I don't know. You, you remind me of an actress by the name of Natalie, so I'm sorry. Melanie. Beautiful name. 
born in Tiberias, right? Speaks Hebrew. <laughs> speaks How is your Hebrew? Terrible. How come? I don't know. You spend Cause, so cause, much time in Because people like you speak English. So I, I'm lazy. Listen. It would be much easier for me to make this interview in Hebrew, believe me. <laughs> um, anyway, how, how, how much you are concerned, what degree, to what degree you are concerned about the Jewish identity of the Jews in the States and all over the world? Look, it's a serious issue and, and yeah, I know. Uh, Avigdor Lieberman mentioned it last night. Um, and it's something that we should all be very concerned about. Uh, intermarriage is very, very high. Um, and, you know, people have so many alternatives today. Uh, I think that there is a huge amount of engagement, though. It's not all bad news. It's not all bad news, but it is very worrisome. Uh, there is, as I said, there's intermarriage. There's so many different options for young people. And, you know, my father, who was a big supporter of Hillel, used to say, you know, you send your kids off to college and you want them to go to good schools. And there they, f they fall in love with who they fall in love with. And, um, you know, so unless you get them early and, and try to give them a solid Jewish education, a solid Jewish home, and it all starts in the home. It's, yeah, yeah. it's one thing, you know, to talk about the federations and talk about Hillel, but it's really got to start. And those are all very important things. Jewish camping is very important. All of that is important, but it must start at home. And it really is a parent's obligation. And as my father said, his biggest regret was not because providing a Jewish home. Two of your brothers married non-Jews, if I'm, if I know correctly. If, if you look back at most of the German Jewish banking families, etc., they're not Jewish anymore. Two they generations were, later, yeah, they were very secular. Very, very secular. So it's and there was a you know a huge wave of, of the mentality was assimilation, right? We want to be part of, as opposed to today, where it's more of a patchwork quilt, or I can be who I want to be and be American at the same time. Yeah. But in America, it's still, it's a, it's a very big problem. But it, there are lots of, outreach is wonderful. It's what synagogues do today are great. There's lots of uh, Jewish education. There's, uh, you know, my kids go to the Heschel School, but it's got to start at home. And the parents have to provide that, that the, the values, the morals, Shabbat, Kabbalah, it's all the holidays. It's very, very important to, you know, the cycle of Jewish life is different than the cycle of... Yeah, and, true. And, and it's really critical that, the, that parents give those values to their children, or I think there really is not. So, we'll lose the Jewish people in yeah, the diaspora. I know, but how do you do it? How do you make the Jews understand the value or the importance of keeping the, or even the symbols of being Jewish, not to forget them? Well, as I said, parents need to do it. They need to learn it from their synagogues. Things like we do with Limud, um, lots of things federations do. It, it, there is tons of stuff being done to keep Jews Jewish, to help them understand. And you know, if you go to Central Synagogue in New York, as an example, yeah. a Reform Synagogue, on Shabbat, it is f completely full of more than 1,000 people every Friday night. You know, obviously the Orthodox synagogues we're not even discussing because that's... Yeah, of course. Right. But the conservative and, and reform movements in America are gaining strength. But it's, it's, a, it's a struggle. It's, it's, you know, it's a challenge and people need to take it very seriously. I think, is it the role of Israel to do some, uh, um, I don't know, um, any movement or any thing inside the Jewish people in the States or just leave it to the community to, you know, not, not Israeli government politics to do it? I think that's a great question. I think that the diaspora has supported the state of Israel uh, since its founding. And I think it is incumbent upon Israel to support the, the diaspora at this point. Uh, and Avigdor said it yesterday, they've got a budget of $100 million to support uh, Jewish outreach around the world and Jewish identity. We need to fight BDS, we need to fight anti-Semitism, we need to fight the delegitimization of the state of Israel. So absolutely, if, if you think of Klal Israel, of the Jewish people, then we have to support each other throughout the world. And you can, if you start thinking Israel is separate from, then, you will, then it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy and Israel will be separate from the diaspora. So yes, I think it's very much incumbent on the Israeli government to do what it can. Obviously there are budget restrictions, et cetera, but that's a separate subject. But philosophically, yes, the government should support things like Limud 
and other programs? They don't. They Unfortunately. Don't, they don't yet. Um, hopefully they will. But I think that it's very important that from a philosophical standpoint that the government does support. I will also say that this government tends to support things that are a little more right wing. And I think it should be a non-political support. Yeah. And today it's too political. Yeah, I know. Right? And it should be based more on a long-term vision of making sure Jews are Jewish, whether they're left wing or right wing. If they're not Jewish, it doesn't matter if they're left wing or right wing. Yeah. The point is that before, you know, Israel only wanted the money of the American Jews. Right. And sh she got it. Yes. In the last years or 10, 15 years, it's getting less and less. The philanthropists, the American ones, you know, all over the world, are donating less money to Israel. And somebody told me, and I don't know if we'll, you will agree with this uh, um, idea, why it happened. He said that, you know, when Israel was founded, uh, most of the American Jews, the, 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 the wealthy one or the, the, the well-off ones, were after the, under the impression of the Holocaust. So they wanted to give money to Israel in order that they will ha have a sanctuary, that's the word, right? Afterwards, in 67, Israel was the mighty Israel in the Six, six Days War, so it was really nice to support a hero, okay? After 73, it turned down a little bit. And now they said that the young generation are really running the business running the funds, they say they feel American, they don't feel any threat to their, to their, to their own flesh and blood. So, and Israel came in the second degree, not the first degree, to donate and to support. Is it true? I think parts of that are true, and I think it's also very individual. So, on a, on a large scale, I think oh. there's, some, there's some truth to that. Of course, Israel's not in danger. In, uh, it's not an existential danger, right? So no. We've got Iran, but it's not like it was before 67. They keep course. saying that Israel, we keep saying that Israel is the most strongest country in the area, a villa in the jungle and whatever. So, you know, yes. they say they, right. they don't need our support or money. Right. So my, my father used to say Israel is a place to support, not to do business in. <laughs> uh, obviously, I feel that it's a place to do both. Um, and, and, but your question is a good one. There are obviously many, many Jews who still support Israel. Um, APAC is incredibly strong. Um, and, and many organizations and synagogues, and, and you look at what UJ is doing, and, and it's real estate division, it's banking division, et cetera. There are missions all the time. What we're doing at the AJC, uh, you know, I'm chairman of the board of trustees yeah. of AJC, um, very strong supporters of, of of Israel and bilateral and trilateral relations between you know Israel, the United States, and, and all the other countries around the world. Um, you see that that there are still delegations coming all the time. Um, but having said that, their priorities I think have have shifted um, amongst donors. Uh, yeah. That where where if you think of the top priority is going to be those who are most in need. Right, in my, in my concentric circles of family, you know, children, extended family, community, and, and the world, you look, Israel's not desperate. Israel's not on the verge of extinction. Israel is, is, exactly. is strong. Uh, so, and so it's, yeah, for them, it's not, it's not anymore an option to come live because they feel very safe in the States. So for them, Israel is not an option anymore. It's, well, you know, it's, it's idea, nice I, to have. I think it's nice to have. Jews have felt safe in the United States for a long, mm. long time. Um, Europe is a different story. Yeah. Even the former Soviet Union is, is a different story. Um, I was in Moscow a couple of weeks ago speaking, and, uh, you know, right now, right now, I think things are, are, are very good. And the Jewish life in Russia is flourishing, but it won't always, it won't necessarily always be that way. Yeah. Uh, and, but, but right now it's, but, you know, you look at what's going on in Europe and it's very, very scary. Yeah, I know. Um, so, and uh, you know, we mentioned that Melanie's here and uh, you're going to get married soon, right? That is correct. Yeah. So where did you two meet? Uh, two years ago in New York. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. 
and she came for an interview, a job interview or something? <laughs> I mean, how did it happen? <laughs> I don't know. It, it was, it was a... As, as I said, I want to know you more in, on a so, personal basis. So, uh, a cousin of mine um, yeah. <clears throat> suggested that I meet her because he thought that she was looking for a job in Jewish not-for-profits. Okay. And he, he is also one of those non, non-Jewish uh, relatives. Uh, the non-Jewish mother, oh. and um, so he said, you're the most wired guy I know in Jewish life. Would you meet this lovely young lady who just moved to New York like two days ago? Uh -huh. um, and so I, he sent me her resume. Um, and you were impressed? Uh, yes, and so we had, we had a coffee, and that's where we met. And the rest is history. And the rest is, no, the history is, is it's a, and the rest is the future. <laughs> The rest, the rest is the future, is the future right. <laughs> so are you going to uh, build a home in Israel too? I mean, Melanie? <laughs> are you going, no, no plans for that. Oh. No, you know, I have other children in New York, so yeah. it's, um, I need to stay, stay there. I guess they were in, also in Israel visiting. I mean. Oh, many times, many, many times, sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sure. Um, so, you know, um, to top it all, I uh, prepared a short questionnaire or you know something nice so okay. you have to answer me like with not yes or no but um, okay. let's see how it goes okay um, it's nice something nice <laughs> uh, what uh, do you prefer vanilla cr ice cream or chocolate ice cream chocolate oh definitely okay cheesecake or macaroon mm. Mm. macaroon macaroon uh, fish or steak you know, kosher, both of them. It depends if I'm cooking or Melanie's cooking. And is she a good cook? <laughs> Fabulous. Or how about you? I'm also good, but I cook steak. That's my specialty. Steaks. Steaks, yes. Oh, all right. That's you know, that's easy. No. It is not. No. I don't know. You know, I don't eat that much meat, but you put it on the grill. No, no. It's got to be properly marinated. It's got to be cooked at the right temperature. It's all right. I promise you, it's not so easy. Okay. Uh, whiskey or red wine? I don't drink. Oh, you don't know? No. Why is that? That's a long story. We don't have time for that. We have. But, but no, we don't. But um, Shivas 18 was definitely uh, something I, mm. I uh, was sort of my go-to. Oh, okay. Nice. <laughs> um, gym or walking in the park? Gym. Oh, you do? How much do you exercise? Every day? No, but three or four times a week. Oh, okay. Uh, that's nice. Tel Aviv or Jerusalem? Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv. Um, Tel Aviv or New York? Oh, that's a toss-up. That's a toss-up. <laughs> All right. And? But I love both, and then we spend a lot of time in both. Okay. Um, now I don't understand. Oh, that's a good but one. They're, but they're your notes. No, no, no. no. That's <laughs> Ikea or Habitat? Uh, Ikea. 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 It's like the mood. The mood, the mood, the mood. I would Ikea, love Ikea, to Ikea. visit your house and see if it's all furnished by Ikea. <laughs> by Habitat? Uh, it is not Habitat, it's like, you know, a generic name. So, and probably people will ask you, why the prices in Ikea in Tel Aviv, in Israel, is 70% higher than the ones in Europe? Well, first of all, that's completely untrue. It is true. Maybe on a few items. Oh. Maybe on a few items. Um, Ikea is very aggressively priced. We've, matter of fact, if you look at our pricing uh, over the last 10 years, our prices today are probably 20% lower than they were 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a discussion we have all the time. But having said that, 1% of our sales is spent on security. Yeah. Just one. Okay, one, per, one full That's percent of sales is spent on security, yes. And there I can give you another list of items such as every single item that we get here has to be unpacked and relabeled because they will not print any, any of their warnings, any of their directions in Hebrew. Oh. So we have to unpack every single item, label every item, and repack it. 
and put it on the shelves. Those are just two examples of extra costs that we have to do business in Israel. So, the, the, for instance, labels are printed, I think, in 37 languages. Is it languages. different from Syria? It's not a good example now. But in, from Dubai, they have to write it in Arabic. Yes, and they do. They do. In, in Sweden? Yes. Well, wherever the manufacturing plants are. Okay, where yes. are they? All oh, over the Sweden? world. Oh, Not all okay. over, in, in Russia, in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, in China, all over the world. And they print in 37 languages, including all the Arab, including Arab. But not Arabic, Hebrew. But not Hebrew. And why is that? Ask them. I was in uh, Sweden, I was in Stockholm about six months ago and to interview the foreign minister of, uh, of uh, Sweden. Yes. She doesn't really like us, you know. Really? Yeah, she doesn't. <laughs> but she said that she's not anti-Semitic and she's for Israel, she said she's pro-Israel. And um, well, I didn't get the impression. No. Yeah, no. so that's, that's And her statements answer. very recently were, would not give that impression that she was pro-Israel. All right. Um, you, you know, you told me that you don't want to talk about American politics, but yet. <laughs> <laughs> Your son played baseball with the son of Trump. Yes. Hillary was the only non-member of the family that was invited to speak at your father's funeral. Correct. So, I mean, you probably, what did you do? I mean. <laughs> what did I do? I didn't, I did what people do. We, I voted. You voted? I, voted. I guess for Hillary. But uh, what was, you know, you called her up. You have her personal phone number in your phone. Can I have it? No. Oh. <laughs> You called her. What did I you didn't call her. You did not. What to speak? At the, yeah, at the to funeral? tell her that you, you know, you're probably sorry, or to see how she is. No, no, no. I didn't call her. I didn't call either of them. I have both their phone numbers, and I didn't call either of them. <laughs> okay. um, look, politics around the world, and and you know, Ron Dory was giving a, a, a very interesting explanation of it the other day, last night actually, and. <clears throat> Politics are very unusual right now. And you see with Brexit, you see what happened in Italy. Uh, luckily, the vote in Austria uh, was, was not what it could have been with the far right uh, party winning. Luckily, they didn't win. Um, in Romania, just uh, this, um, this week, the socialists, uh, the, yes, left, the, the left, left wing. Yeah, they so won. It's, you, you can't really predict. Um, and, and, you know, Donald Trump, is the president-elect of the United States. And for better or worse, and we will see. <laughs> we have to accept it. We, it is what it is. And, you know, again, you know, I, I feel the same way in Israel. You know, Bibi is, 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 the, uh, is the prime minister, and I support him. And Donald Trump is the president, and I will support him. He's the president. And one of the things that I love about American politics is it is unique in history in the way that we transfer power every four years, yeah. even if you get reelected, it's a transfer, um, every four years in a nonviolent way. And whether you're for or against the candidate, that, that person becomes the president, and you have the option to vote them out four years later. Yeah. Um, and I think it's an amazing, amazing experiment it's, in yeah, political history. And if you, know, if, you, if you like it, great. And if you don't, just be a little patient, and you have time to, to change it. You know, how, how, how did I know that Trump is going to win? Yeah. Because if you look at the history of the elections in the United States, you see that except for, I think, twice over the 300 and something years, only twice after eight years, they didn't change from Democrats to Republicans or from Republicans right. to Democrats. And after eight years of Obama, they changed back to Republican. And, you know, it only happened with George Bush, the, the father. Right. Well, and after I think years with uh, Carter, I think also he only, he was there only for four years. But usually the change every it's, eight years. Certainly after eight years, it's very hard for, for a party to continue in power. Mm -hmm. And it only happened after Clinton, and then it was Bush Jr., and then Obama, and now so Republicans. It was eight years, eight so years. they change all Every, the time. Yeah. And I think it's a great system because, you know, if what you didn't do in eight years, you are not going to do in 12. Correct. Or whatever. And I think part of what, what, what's part of what was against Hillary was that she ran as a third term of Obama. Yeah. So she didn't even try in a lot of ways to define herself 
yeah. differently. Yeah, I know. And and I don't think people wanted a third term yeah, of Obama. Exactly. Yeah, um, probably. But I have to say something that is that is fascinating <clears throat> that I learned the other night that as of three o'clock in the afternoon, the day of the election, Trump was writing a concession speech. You're kidding? No, I'm not kidding. People inside his suite were. We're, we're sure that he's going to lose. We're sure. We're, they, were, they were literally preparing a concession speech. And he said, I'm not writing. My, kid, my kids can write it, and I'll look at it later. Uh, so it, I think he was one of the reasons I think you're seeing a little bit of scrambling yeah, know. now in terms of trying to put the cabinet together, and et cetera, is because they really didn't think they were going to win. They and, really didn't. They, yeah. I guess they believed the polls, which and were I, completely wrong. I don't know if you know the next uh, ambassador to the, of the US to Israel, David Friedman. He's consulted. Yesterday, uh, he was nominated the ambassador to Israel. Right. So I don't know if you know him. But anyway. I don't. I know a couple of his law partners, but I've never met him. Yeah, but I guess, and you said it many times when you were, you've been interviewed about Trump and Hillary, you said both of them will be good for Israel. Yeah. Is that true? You still hold this. Uh, I think Trump will. Well, we don't have to worry about Hillary now. But, <laughs> uh, uh, but, but I think Trump will be very good for Israel. I, you know, I hope that uh, I w some, somebody was, who was very left-wing was having this conversation with me. And he said, no, the worst thing that can happen for Israel is for the United States to allow Israel to do anything it wants. And my hope, and I would say this uh, to anybody who asked, inside the government or out, I said, if I'm in a, in a battle with somebody, I'm, I'm willing to go across the street if you're covering my back. Yeah. I'm not willing to go across the street if I don't trust you. Yeah, true. And Bibi didn't trust Obama. Yeah. If, if Obama Bibi... didn't trust him. Okay, but that's, that's true, but not as relevant in the, to this yeah. point. So if, Bibi's, <laughs> if Bibi and the government is willing now, is, it has the desire to try to make peace, it's whatever that means, it's separation, peace, whatever. If the United States is covering his back, he's more willing to try. When you felt like you had nobody to cover your back, you're not going to stick your neck out. And so Trump my, is going to cover. And I think back. I think absolutely that Trump will, will will have our oh. back, and that's my hope anyway. Is that with a strong relationship between yes. the United States and Israel, Israel will be able to try to take some steps uh, towards a, a resolution, whatever the resolution is. And I don't know what what. I it, hope what, it's what not it. like uh, um, um, I don't know how to say it, but. Uh, to enforce the Israeli law all over, or to, to you know, to... I, I'm just saying, I hope, I hope that whatever steps that will advance peace and security for the region, uh, and however that form takes, that, that the Israelis feel that now with the support of the United States, that they can, they can move forward, where before they felt perhaps a little bit, yeah. you know, naked, if you well, will, in that. Yeah. So that's, that's my hope. So, a new sheriff in town. A new let's sheriff see. in town. Let's, let's see. Let's see what he will do. Yes. <laughs> so we have, I think, our time is up. Okay. Thank you very much. My so pleasure. I got to know you a little bit. I know that you like chocolate ice cream, which is nice. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I hope that one day a woman will be in the White House. You know, I was there in the, in the Capitol Hill yeah. uh, two months ago for the first time in Washington. And in the, it, there is a hall there and there is a statue, I, I, I have it here, of the suffragists, yeah. you know, They're and there. three of them. And behind them, in the same statue, there is like a rock and he's waiting for the the first woman uh, president. Woman president. Well, and you're ahead of us here in Israel. You've already had a woman prime yeah. minister. Yeah. So. yeah, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.